My guest today is Chris Roach. Chris is the founder of Catalyst Consulting, a full service revenue and pipeline growth focused marketing agency. After successfully exiting two prior companies, Chris is now working with early stage B2B SaaS companies in both strategy and execution of paid social and leading demand gen campaigns. In today's episode, we talk about how is digital marketing changing in this recession? Is YouTube a suitable platform for demand gen? Why do so many companies overinvest in Google and Bing ads? And with pipelines drying up and deals stalling, what should you be focused on as a marketer? All great stuff. Let's jump right in. Okay, Chris, I'm really excited to talk to you today because for one, it's marketing and that's always a subject that, I mean, it's endless, isn't it? Like, mm-hmm. <laughs> But thank you so much for taking time to, to speak with me today. I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. No, thanks for having me. Looking forward to uh, talking with you on this. Yeah, I have to start, though, by asking you about the RV situation, because you are traveling. How far are you into the your travels right now? So we bought an RV about three months ago. My wife and I have been talking about it for three years, back when we lived in California, and we were paying crazy high rent prices for this uh, in a very small one-bedroom apartment. And we're looking at RVs and we're thinking, you know, we like traveling. I've always worked remote. So I've always had the flexibility to be able to kind of work from anywhere. We've lived and traveled pretty frequently just with our jobs anyway. So we've been, you know, um and ahhing about it for a number of years. And then this year we kind of got to the point where we're like, let's pull the trigger. So we bought a 36 foot motorhome, 17 years old. You know, she's, she's not, you know, nothing fancy. And we completely gutted the inside and completely renovated it to look basically like a modern apartment. So it looks amazing. Like it looks really, really cool now. My wife basically worked full time for three months renovating this. She's the handy one. I'm, I'm not, which is people always, people always assume it's me that's doing it. I don't know for what reason, but I'm <laughs> completely useless with everything outside of picking up the heavy things. So she's renovated, you know, all of it. And then we, went off for kind of our trial run in the last couple of weeks. Uh, so we went up to Door County in Wisconsin, you know, did a week there. We've done local ones and really we're ramping up to be able to go off in the winter from January to April and go do a, a prolonged road trip, live, work, travel in the RV and basically escape the winter here in Wisconsin, which if you're not familiar with, is just brutal, just oh, yeah. freezing, freezing weathers for, you know, two or three months. And for us, you know, we, it's not something we particularly enjoy. So we're looking at how we can escape that and still be able to travel and explore and kind of have that freedom. That sounds like so much fun, especially because you you work in a way that you can work anywhere. And that's what's great about doing you know, marketing and, and and the things that we do. It sounds like a lot of fun, but I'd be nervous about what if you forget stuff? And I, I don't know. I'm just <laughs> worried about not being able to access things I want to access. But you know, it sounds like a great plan. So you're going to be in one place for a while, though, for the winter. Traveling around. So we'll be we'll be heading south, basically, until it hits about 70 degrees. We'll make our first stop and then kind of trickle around from there. So, yeah, we're looking at the the Carolinas. We, we actually looked at Tennessee as well. We, we were thinking about going before Christmas, but I think we're going to delay that until after Christmas now and basically make our way down to to Florida, to kind of Southern Florida specifically, spend a longer time period there, and then we'll make our way back up for the spring in Wisconsin. Yeah. Well, that makes sense. No one wants to be in Wisconsin during the winter, I think. No, it's, it, the summers here are beautiful and the, the fall here is not bad. The summers are beautiful, but the other nine months a year, it, it's, uh, it's testing. I used to live in Connecticut, which isn't as bad as Wisconsin as far as how cold it gets, but it was cold enough. I'm in Arizona now and I'm done with the winter. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. So your business, so Catalyst Consulting, it's only, it, how old is it? You've been doing it for a year or two? Yeah, we just hit our one year mark in October. Actually, just we just passed the one year mark. So I, I started the company, yeah, twenty twenty one at the beginning of October. Wow, so that's great. So it seems like it's really taking off for you. And I know you've been on other podcasts, and um, I think that's great. So when we talk about like everyone's talking about how do you think we're in a recession? I hear there's a lot of debate about this. Like, yes, we are. You know, my my financial advisor says we're not. And then I had people saying, yeah, well, I looked at my investments and yeah, we are. Because I wanted to ask you, how has digital marketing changed? Because 
it seems like we are in a recession, right? Yeah, I don't think there's any doubt about the fact that we're in a recession. And I also don't think there's any doubt about the fact that it's going to get worse before it gets better. The question is, how much worse? And when you talk about, like you say, financial advisors, stock markets, you know, that's all taking a hit. That's not something that I'm by any means an expert on. What we're seeing is the buyer behavior change significantly, especially in the last really three months. You're moving into Q4. Q4 is always a difficult time to close deals anyways. Anybody that's in marketing sales, no, it's the worst time of year, Thanksgiving, Christmas, you know, there's breaks all over the place. You know, people just aren't in that buying mode in general. Then you layer on the fact that there's this uncertainty that exists right now. And like you say, are we in a recession? Are we not in a recession? Is it going to get worse? How much worse is it going to get? So there's a lot of uncertainty around that. So what we're seeing is this buying behavior is stalling for a lot of industries right now where people are making purchasing decisions. They're not pulling the trigger. Deals are stalling, pipelines drying up. And it's quite a a unique situation as a marketer to navigate, especially if you've not had to do this before. You know, a lot of marketers maybe haven't had to navigate a recession before. The last four years have been very promising. You know, again, it's quite a unique situation to navigate as a marketer as the social panels have social platforms have changed as well. So what we're seeing is less people are buying, which means that there is basically less demand to capture. And yet the knee-jerk reaction from the majority of, of, uh, or in my opinion, I guess, inexperienced marketers is to funnel funds into Google ads, into Bing ads, into trying to get these further down the funnel entry points and content information, despite the fact that there are less buyers in the market today. So what, I mean, what are, what's the mistake that marketers are making? So you say that they're, you know, trying to do all the ads and like, so what, what should they be doing instead? Yeah. So there's two problems that you face when you're a marketer that's trying to market in today's world in terms of navigating a recession in Q4. So there are less buyers. So there's there's less people who are actively going to be purchasing your product. So there's increased competition just because of the fact that that decreases. Then the knee-jerk reaction from the majority of marketers is to shift budget into Google ads, into that demand capture channel, which means the costs goes up. So now you have more competition, increased costs, which basically puts you in a position where your customer acquisition cost is going to go through the roof and you're putting yourself in the position of becoming a commodity because all of your competitors are doing the same thing. So you're all now really competing after this less than 1% of the market at this point, whereas what you can start to do in terms of building out more of a longer-term strategy is looking at the other social platforms, looking at LinkedIn, looking at Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, these other platforms where you can start to get in front of your target market, your ICP, knowing that they're not in buying mode. So when you shift that marketing focus and instead of saying, right, we're going to try and get you to close a contract with us in the next three months, instead we say, right, how can we educate, entertain, build that brand affinity with you today, knowing that in six, 12, 18 months, when you then enter that buying mode, you're going to come to us directly and you're not searching on Google for financial forecasting software. You're going straight to the website. You're going straight to that account executive who you're connected with on LinkedIn. You're reaching out to the VP of marketing. Whatever the situation is, how can we build that demand that we can ultimately take advantage of in 12 months time? And that's where most marketers and most companies that I'm seeing aren't making that change. They're kind of following following the herd and that kind of herd mentality of let's shift all the budget into Google Ads, which is why we have this significant increase in cost. It's starting to level off a little bit on Google Ads at the moment, but it's still the most expensive it's ever been in history. So to launch that campaign now, I would challenge you to question whether that's the best option or is there a way to set yourself up for longer term success, knowing that people just simply aren't buying. So you're trying to you're trying to bring somebody in who's really not ready to purchase. So are you saying that we really shouldn't worry too much right now about making the actual sale, but focus more on the demand end of it? Exactly. Exactly. Less people are buying. So it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you do right now. People aren't going to purchase. And that's kind of the, the difficult mindset to get your head around. Unless you have built up 
significant demand for your company over the last two years, which not a lot of companies have done, you're going to really struggle to suddenly flip a switch and capture demand because there is no demand. Your product is simply a commodity and it just comes down to the price really, not even features for a lot of them. So a lot of companies are in that situation where they haven't been investing in the right places prior. So they don't have that existing demand that they've been able to build up. They don't have that brand affinity. They don't have any kind of relationship with their ICP. So suddenly they want to shift budget and try and scale a, basically a channel that is at the saturation point, right. which is the most expensive it's ever been. So as you try and scale that, all you're going to see is your costs increase with that, and you're not going to have any better results. So it's as a marketer, it's a very difficult situation to explain because most leadership wants leads coming in. They want qualified opportunities. They want to go and close deals. And it's very difficult as a market to explain to leadership and say, we're not going to close that many deals in the next three months, but this is how we can build up for a successful future in 12 months time. And as a startup, depending on your runway, that could be extremely terrifying because not every startup has two years runway. And that's that's how we're currently working with our clients with a lot of these earlier stage B2B SaaS companies. We're working with them, making sure that they understand how they can invest today without being able to run out of runway. How can we invest in a responsible way for the future? But you have to actually be able to get there to be able to reap the rewards when you have made those investments. It's scary because even for someone like me, you know, as a copywriter, it's like I have people who I know are not pulling the trigger on any of their copywriting until I, I've been reaching out to former clients and they're like, well, you know, it looks like after the first of the year, maybe, but it's a similar sort of thing. And it makes you nervous because it's like, oh, yeah. I would like to close some deals myself. It's interesting you say that my husband and I are in the process of selling my, my parents have a house nearby and we've had it on the market for over a month and about six months ago this house would have sold overnight literally and we had an offer last week it was for asking price but they had all these contingencies for it and it ended up actually coming in lower than our asking price and we pushed back on just the typical things and went with 45 day clothes we went with one of their days and we had like three or four different stipulations and they came back and just said no take it or leave it and mm-hmm. so we make the deal. But they were in that position of like, like, I know that there's not much, you know, inventory out there as far as houses and, you know, real estate. So they took full advantage of that and they expected us to just jump at it. And it was frustrating. So it's almost like a similar thing in a different area, you know, um, and you talk about, you mentioned YouTube. So YouTube, is it a, a suitable platform for demand gen? And how does it differ from all the other ones as far as they're creating? Yeah, you, YouTube is an interesting platform to to bring into your demand gen strategy. I would say for me, it's not a core platform that I'm going to invest on invest in before I've really saturated or hit a point where I feel that comfortable that we have a successful campaign with other platforms such as Google Ads and LinkedIn. Predominantly LinkedIn with B2B SaaS companies, the level of targeting just far surpasses any other platform. When we're looking at YouTube from an organic side, YouTube has the the beauty of it. It's an evergreen mm-hmm. video, basically. You post it, it can continue to get views for months to come. YouTube has a very strong search engine, especially with the how to do this, how to implement this, what's the best way to do this. Those questions get asked to YouTube frequently. And as Google owns YouTube, they ha- they rank very highly in Google searches as well. So from an organic strategy, it's something that if you have the bandwidth to invest in today, I think it's a great idea. I don't think it's going to necessarily close a significant amount of revenue for you in the next three to six months, but it's a great way to start investing in basically what is becoming the modern SEO in terms of what was previously blog articles. Now it's YouTube videos. That I think is a great way to start building up that organic approach from a paid strategy, especially with B2B marketing in demand generation, the ability to target on YouTube is relatively limited. So you don't have that ability to go and search by job titles. You have some industries, you have you know certain channels that you can target, but the ability to target that top of funnel. I'm looking to work with chief marketing officers of SaaS companies under 50 employees that are currently hiring for this position. You can't do that on YouTube. So one of the best ways that we bring YouTube in as a strategy is really in that retargeting layer. So once we've had people visiting the website, interacting with our content, we can then set up those retargeting layers on YouTube to be able to further educate. And when we talked earlier about how we can educate, entertain, 
build brand affinity, that's one of those secondary platforms that we'll bring into the mix in terms of that retargeting layer. But to go out and launch a YouTube campaign as your primary channel and your primary source of building revenue is extremely difficult. And especially in B2B, it's something that we don't see a lot of success with. So we tend to focus much more heavily on LinkedIn for that top of funnel initial targeting. That's interesting because I I spoke with someone recently about YouTube and she was big into promoting YouTube as just for getting your content out there. And what she had said, because we were talking about TikTok and YouTube. And the thing is, she says, you can post on YouTube because all the podcasts that I do, I post them up on YouTube. So it's a weekly thing. And a lot of people are are following me on YouTube just because they will watch. They won't necessarily watch the video, but they will listen to it. And I don't know why, but it's like the video is there and that you have the podcast, but it gives them another option, I guess. Mm -hmm. But she said that it worked because it's like just once a week, like you said, it has the longevity. People will, I used to have a fitness business and, and people are still looking at the fitness video. And I have some videos that have like thousands, thousands of, of views from years ago and i'm not doing anything with it so mm-hmm. that was the advantage but i wanted to ask you what is your take on tiktok for b2b because there's a lot of debate about about it yeah i, I love tiktok for b2b i'm active on the platform i post i don't know three five times a week i like I, tr- I try and post every day but i sometimes don't make it just been a lot busier recently than i was planning on being for an organic approach i think it's great to go and build up a brand on there the way i view tiktok is really it's a portfolio of all of my content so when i come on podcasts like this and it gets chopped off afterwards i'll post it on tiktok as those, snip- uh, those snippets one minute three minute videos it becomes a portfolio so when i'm actually talking with potential clients and they're asking for, hey, can we, you know, can we listen to any of the podcasts? Can we learn more about your approach with marketing? I'll send them a TikTok profile. I'm like, go to this profile. It's got everything I've ever said about marketing on a podcast on. And you can sit and you can scroll for an hour and it'll have all the highlights for you. So for me, from an organic approach, TikTok is a highlight reel of, of my content content that I'll publish on there. The reach that you will have as a B2B marketer talking specifically about demand generation techniques, you're not going to have 100,000 views on that content. It doesn't have the virality in terms of the market that you can go after like a lot of people associate with TikTok. So as long as you know that going into it and you don't expect to have 50,000 views talking about marketing, then it can be a very successful campaign for you. And we've had a lot of opportunities come through our website. We just have a simple, you know, self-report attribution. How did you hear about us? You know, where did you first hear about, you know, Catalyst? You know, if you if it if it's Chris, like what what is it that you where did you find Chris? And quite a few are citing TikTok as now how they found me specifically and then ultimately Catalyst. And that's been interesting to see that evolution because it predominantly it was all LinkedIn. Prior it was all LinkedIn that was doing that. And we've now shifted to more of a split between TikTok and LinkedIn. But on the surface of things, if you look at it, you have 500 views on a video, it doesn't sound that great. But when those 500 views are all potential buyers that want to, that are in market, that are potentially looking at finding a service like yours, that's when it can really become valuable. And that's to me is where I see the value with TikTok from an organic approach, at least. I love the idea of it being a portfolio because I've had other marketers that said, hey, follow me on TikTok. And I'm on there for my own entertainment and watching, you know, like if you could tap dance to marketing, I think you would really have me because <laughs> there are people rapping and there's tap dancing. And I mean, every marketer that I see on there, it's pretty much just cut and dry. This is like you said, like a portfolio of information. But I love, you know, when I'm thinking about this, how each one could be like a mini topic and that mm-hmm. you, think, you know exactly what it is you're looking for. And if you want to hear about a particular part of marketing, they would, the person could look through all of your thumbnails and just see, okay, this is where he's talking about this. Um, I think that that's great. Can you say a word, a couple words about LinkedIn? So LinkedIn, you said was your main focus and now it's not as much or how is LinkedIn fitting into everything? LinkedIn from an organic approach has been where the majority of contact submissions through our website has come from in terms of my profile. I push everything through my own LinkedIn profile. I have a decent size following on LinkedIn. That's where the majority of opportunities for Catalyst comes from is from my personal LinkedIn. What we found is that TikTok has been able to bring in now 
more and more opportunities. Whereas before it was 95% LinkedIn, now it's 60% LinkedIn, 40% TikTok in terms of the breakup of where those opportunities are coming from. So TikTok is becoming a larger channel for us. However, LinkedIn is still the, the biggest opportunity for us. And when we talk about the way that we work with clients, specifically when we're targeting medium to enterprise level businesses and very specific job titles or industries, LinkedIn paid is by far the most successful platform for us to be able to target very, very specifically and then set up those retargeting layers from there. So LinkedIn has always been kind of that top of funnel, get that initial videos out in front of people, help educate, help entertain, you know, those uh, those intended audiences, and then be able to set up those retargeting layers from there. In B2B, there isn't a better platform as a sweeping statement than LinkedIn. It's where your buyers hang out. It's where you can target the most easily. And even if you're looking at more of an organic approach, you can go in with Navigator, with different add-on tools, very easily find who you want to basically market to, go and connect with them, send them a message, thank you them for accepting your invite. Next thing you know, any of the content that you're publishing is appearing in their newsfeed. It's a very simple way of getting in front of your target audience at relatively low barrier to entry. Yeah. And that's, that's cool. I just recently got on sales navigator and I'm just, it takes a little bit of learning to figure out like as an individual, just, I haven't used it. So I'm trying to, you know, I'm actually gone on YouTube. How do you use sales navigator? There you go. So, you know, it, it, it all, merges together at some point, you know? So when you mentioned like pipelines are drying up, especially towards, you know, the end of the year and Q4, you talked about a lot of this, but is there anything else marketers should focus on that you haven't mentioned or that you want to add on to for the end of the year, especially if people are getting as frustrated as they are? <laughs> I think the, yeah, I think one of the important things to note as a marketer Specifically with where we are now in Q4, you know, October is all but done. You know, we're, we're basically at November at the moment. With November and December, you've got Christmas and Thanksgiving. And as a B2B marketer, those are down periods for buyers for engaging with platforms. So you have to, you have to make that adjustment going into November, December, knowing that you should probably probably have your ads turned off or significantly turned down for that week of Thanksgiving for basically, in my opinion, from the 20th of December until like the 5th of January in terms of actually running your paid social campaigns. Now, if you're managing a $20,000 budget on LinkedIn, that doesn't mean that you have to shut it off for a week and therefore only hit 15000 on LinkedIn that month in ad spend, but you can bring that budget earlier and start to invest that earlier into the month, knowing that you're going to have that down period. But if you run ads on Facebook, on Instagram, on TikTok, even on LinkedIn around Thanksgiving or Christmas, your CPMs are going to go through the roof because of that increase in competition just across the platforms in general. So as a B2B marketer, I'm always telling anyone that's asking right now, get ready to invest early in November, turn it off at the end of the month, invest in the first two weeks of December, dial it right down basically until the end of the year and then pick it back up in January. You don't want to be running this level 10, 15,000 a month across both months because you will see a significant decrease in performance across those two weeks in either sides of the month as well. So that's something that I would make sure that any marketer is aware of. It sounds obvious, but I can't tell you how many previous campaigns I've audited where they've ran it the same and then been surprised where results just haven't happened in the last two months. Yeah, that's interesting. I noticed you don't mention Facebook at all. Is that still a thing or it's just not really for B2B? It's, I think Facebook has a place for B2B. In honest, you know, full honesty with, with my clients and my campaigns that we're running, we just don't see that much success on Facebook compared to other platforms that we're running. And we've tried it significantly over and over again with different clients. You know, it's something that we set up as really retargeting layers. Again, the same way that we'll kind of use YouTube once they've, once they've interacted with really high intent pages on websites, once they've consumed certain amounts of content, we will then retarget them on Facebook because it's another touch point and it's another way to get in front of them. But in terms of going after cold audiences, even with tools, you know, metadata, Clearbit, Apollo, you know, whatever it is, we just don't see the same level of success as we do with LinkedIn. Some people say, oh, it's because if people aren't in business mode on Facebook, they're in business mode on LinkedIn. I actually don't agree with that. I don't think it really matters. If you're producing entertaining content, people are going to watch it no matter where they are. I just think the ability to target is so limited on Facebook and it's only getting worse where five years ago when I was running Facebook campaigns, it was the main platform that we were running 
paid social on. And we had crazy low customer acquisition costs. We had crazy high returns on investments, but we've slowly been shifting that more and more over to LinkedIn now and using Facebook as basically a secondary campaign. Now for anything B2C, it's a great option for you. You know, There's very good targeting on there, but if you're selling a $50,000 ACV, it's very difficult to generate that opportunity on Facebook alone. And the quality of the traffic that comes in is significantly lower than other platforms. So you end up wasting a lot of time. Your sales teams waste a lot of time. And for me, the juice just isn't worth the squeeze at the moment in terms of building any significant campaigns on Facebook. Yeah, I, I used to do a lot of, I used to write a lot of Facebook ads for clients. It was mainly B2C, but not so much anymore. And then I go on just for my own like I don't, I'm not active on there at all because it's personally, I find it to become really toxic. Um, but I just want to see what other people are doing on there. And the ads, I don't even trust the testimonial. I don't t- trust what any, any no. of the ads. I bought a couple of products and I've been disappointed in pretty much all of them. And it's like, though now I don't even trust platform for, for being safe. So I was trying to think, I didn't think I've seen any, and one company I worked for, they were selling franchises, but that wasn't they were just kind of advertising for it, but they ended up just stopping all the Facebook ads. It just wasn't working. So it seems like it seems like that's the thing. But yeah, so uh, last question. So where can people find you and find out more about you and, and what you do? Yeah, so me personally, to, uh, if you're interested in connecting with me, LinkedIn's a great option. I'm sure you can put you know links on there as well. You know, LinkedIn and, and TikTok are the two main places that I'm hanging out. If you are interested in learning more about Catalyst, you can head to our website, which is catalystconsulting.services. We have the option on there just to book a call either with myself or someone on my team, and we do free marketing consultations, free audits, basically to get a sense of if there is a potential client that we can help. And at the moment, you know, we do have the capacity to bring on one or two more clients. So we are actively in conversations right now to bring on a couple of clients. If anybody is listening and is interested, you know, please feel free to reach out. Awesome. Well, thank you again for your time. I really appreciate it. This has been absolutely super helpful and really interesting. Thanks again. Yep. Thank you very much.